let us pray our great god in heaven we thank you and we bless your name for yet another privilege of coming to hear your word at this day of worship we thank you because you've been with us already in the teaching of Sadi scripture and in all the other things we have done we thank you because of the assurance within us that when we talk to you we talk to a real father and when we hear your word we hear your real will your mind revealed unto us how we pray that today you will be with us once again as we consider this important word. We are praying, O oh Lord, that you will assist us and you will cleanse us from everything that is contrary to your will. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will so cleanse us that we will have the image of Christ within us. Be with us, Lord, and help us, Lord, to be doers of your word. We pray that your word will be effective in our lives influencing everything that we do in jesus name we pray we're looking at romans chapter 3 and verse 31 romans chapter 3 verse 31 as we look at this verse i'm sure you know that we've been following this series as we have been considering the effectiveness of saving faith living faith dynamic faith in the life of a child of god in relationship to his conduct, his behavior, in relationship to his attitude to the law of God. Actually, you know, it's a question that comes at the end of chapter 3. As Paul the Apostle had, de had um, delivered to them the message of justification by faith, of salvation in Christ, telling us it is by faith and faith alone. Then he asks the question, in Romans 3.31, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. As we have been on this verse, and we have been considering the relationship of faith, living, saving faith, with the law of God, the moral law of God, we have seen very clearly that when faith is operative in our lives, that faith will touch the heart, change the heart, change the life, and change the behavior. And we have been looking at the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments in particular, one by one. We've gone through Numbers 1 to 9. And what remains for us today is to look at the effectiveness of saving faith, cleansing faith, the faith that sets free, delivering faith, in relationship with the tenth commandment and so we're going to look at faith that sets us free from covetousness faith that sets us free from covetousness i've told you in times past that faith is closely connected with love the love for god and the love for our fellow man when we believe on the lord jesus christ it reconciles us with god not only that, it reconciles us with our fellow man. It makes us to love God and love our fellow man. And if we love God, we're going to have the right attitude to the commandments of God. If we love man, if we love our neighbors, we're going to have the right attitude also to our fellow man. In fact, we're told in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not be a false witness, thou shalt not covet, you see that, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The concluding thing comes in verse 10, as it tells us, love walketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So then, as we look at this particular commandment in particular, we we'll see that it is faith that so cleanses us, that so works within us, that so sets us free, that covetousness is taken away from our lives. Look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. Exodus chapter 20 verse 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. 
thou shalt not covet is man servant nor is maid servant nor is ox nor is ass nor anything that is thy neighbors from the time that Eve desired the forbidden fruit and ate that forbidden fruit and also gave to her husband Adam to eat covetousness has been the universal sin of man sinful desire for what others have which we don't have is a great sin in fact it is the cause of many other sins and many crimes in life however when saving faith is truly really manifested in christ the heart is changed and our lives are free from covetousness as we look at the relationship of faith saving faith and cleansing from covetousness freedom from covetousness we we'll look at three major points number one covetousness man's damning sin covetousness man's damning sin number two conversion with godliness with contentment conversion brings godliness with contentment number three maintaining victory over covetousness maintaining victory over covetousness as we look at these subtitles and we look at the various references of scripture these things are to show us that if we're truly saved there will be the evidence in our lives there is nothing like being saved and lacking evidence there is nothing like being saved and there will be no change of life if we are truly saved if we are truly born again there will be the evidence in our lives and will be totally set free we will manifest freedom from covetousness what is covetousness where do we find covetousness what are the evidences of covetousness in the life of the natural man that brings us to point one covetousness man's damning sin already i have read unto you but let's go back to that exodus chapter 20 verse 17 thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant nor his maidservant nor his ox nor his ass nor anything 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 that is thy neighbor's the word of god goes against covetousness in fact we are commanded very strictly and firmly that we must not covet from a pin to a palace belonging to a neighbor that whatever it is anything however small anything however big we must not desire to have what belongs to our neighbor and eventually take it with uh, from him either by violence force or fraud we should not covet anything that belongs to a neighbor whether our neighbor at present is using it or not whether it is something that we would like to have or not whatever it is we should not covet it talks about the anything and it talks about three categories of things number one the inanimate objects belonging to our neighbor it may be like a house it's a uh, mentioned that we should not covet our neighbor's house those are things not having life and that stands for every other thing that may not have life like a car a house like machinery we must not covet that which belongs to our neighbor and then it says that we should not covet his ox this comes to the area of living things but like uh, an animal like uh, what our neighbors may find useful then it comes to the third category human beings maid servant man servant or wife that we should not covet and even those three those three areas in animate objects or the animals or the human beings belonging to our neighbor even though they cover every side and every area yet to make sure that nothing is lost it says nor anything that belongs to your neighbor and yet as i've told you in this first point that covetousness 
is the damning sin, the great sin, the universal sin, the common sin of man. You find it in many lives because they have not known the Lord. You see, it is the, it is the lust of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the sin that people want so that they will be able to make what belongs to others their own. But it is sinful and it is not right. It is not according to the word of God. How is covetousness manifested in the life of the sinner or the life of the backslider? In Joshua chapter 7, Joshua chapter 7 verse 21, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them, then I coveted them and took them and behold they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it here we see what happened to Achan actually the Lord had commanded the children of Israel he had said they shouldn't touch they shouldn't take any of the things they'll find in Jericho because everything was to be consecrated unto the Lord but then Achan obviously happened to have been among the warriors of the children of Israel, among the people that went in, among the adults that went in, so that they will be able to capture that city after the walls had fallen down. And then it tells us of what happened to him. Because actually, do you know, that sin of covetousness that eventually led him to take what he took, brought defeat upon the children of Israel because without knowing what had happened they went on into battle and even though the Lord had promised them that no man shall be able to stand before them that they will defeat the enemy that every soul of the foot every place the soul of their foot shall tread upon it shall be theirs but you know they suffered defeat in fact some people died and so Joshua and the elders in Israel they came to the presence of the Lord wanting to know the reason for the defeat that came upon them. It was then that the Lord told them there is sin in the camp. And when they found out, eventually they discovered Achan had done what he did. You see, this sin causes defeat in the lives of many people. It causes lack of answer to prayer in the lives of many people. It makes the Lord to forsake people because it is a great sin how did this sin come upon him not only that how did it produce another evil in his life i want you to look at three uh, three verbs here it says in verse 21 when i saw when i saw you see that is the beginning if you do, we, we see many things but then not everybody that sees covets and not everything that we see leads us to covetousness. But to see the starting point of covetousness is seeing. Here is a man. He sees another person's wife. And then thoughts begin to come up in his mind. As if that person's wife is uh, more beautiful than his own wife. When I saw or sees another person riding a vehicle. And it is at that point when I saw or sees another person's farm. Another person's vineyard and he feels this is wonderful. Or he sees another person's house. Or he sees another person that is a, a servant to another individual. Hard working servant. When I saw. Or he sees another person's child. When I saw. Or he, or he goes to attend the wedding and he sees the beauty of the wedding is attending. When I saw. That is the very beginning of what may cause covetousness in a person's life then he said i coveted when i saw you see what happens is that for people that allow covetousness to take root in their heart when they see they do not just see and pass by they do not just see and forget it they do not just see and allow, and allow the thing to go like that they begin to think about it they begin to meditate about it they begin to brood over the thoughts coming upon them coming within them and then he said when i saw there was no discussion with anybody 
But then he was by himself and he was thinking about it, meditating upon it. What if I take this? What if it belongs to me? What this thing will befit me? This Babylonish garment and this wedge of silver and this weight of silver and gold. I'll just become rich instantaneously all of a sudden. What I didn't have before, I will have. Then he began to think and his mind and his flesh began to plan with him. You'll be richer than even Joshua. You'll be richer than all these other people. You have just come out of the wilderness and all the things you brought away from the land of Egypt. Everything has been spent. Everything has finished. And nobody has anything now. In fact, I'll become head and shoulders above the rest of the children of Israel. When I saw, thoughts became many in the heart. And then he said, I coveted. You see, after that, there's the next step. When a person has seen, and when a person has coveted, he'll be looking for opportunity to take it. He'll be looking here and there. I hope nobody will see me. I hope nobody will discover. You see, when you see, it leads on to coveting and it leads, it leads on to taking. Then he said, I took. I took them. Three points. Number one, I saw. Number two, I coveted. Number three, I took. Isn't this the way all sins begin in the life of an individual? When I saw, you must refer back to the time of Eve. Eve saw, and then Eve took, and then Eve ate. Now, you will see that, that if because of the covetousness in the heart of man, it begins by seeing, and what you see, you begin to desire. You begin to say, shouldn't I have that? Shouldn't I have that? At that point, it is not yet sin. At that point, it is temptation. When well, you saw that thing, and the devil brought suggestion to your mind, and he brought some thoughts to your mind, and he said, why don't you take it? Why do you think you are forbidding to use it? Why? Isn't that jewelry something? Why? Isn't that kind of a dressing, isn't it good? What you see on that unbeliever, shouldn't you practice it? At that point, it is temptation. If at the point of sin, you say, no, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think and meditate upon a maid or upon another person's property? And then you say, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm a child of God now. I should not do that thing. I remember the word of God. That thou shalt not covet. If you take your son at that point, you become an overcomer. And that thing will not be your ruin. In the case of this man... Achan, he coveted, he desired it so passionately. It became what he was thinking about all the time. And what he was dreaming about in the night. You see many dreams come as a result of multitudes of business during the day. What you coveted during the day, if you are not careful, you will be dreaming about it in the night. He was thinking about it and dreaming about it. And eventually, when he woke up, he went and he took the thing. And so, covetousness. Is a very terrible sin, and it is the common sin of men. Well, in Second Kings chapter five, Second Kings chapter five, we're reading from verse twenty. Second Kings five twenty. But Gezi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God said, Behold, my master has spared Naaman, the Syrian, in not receiving at a sand that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. Again, that is the manifestation of covetousness. And you know the story? It became the ruin of the servant of Elisha. Naaman had come and he had received healing. And he had pleaded with Elisha that Elisha would receive some gift from him. But Elisha said no. He, although he had not known the word of the Lord in the New Testament because Jesus had not come. That says, freely you have received and freely give. Yet he was going by that principle because the same spirit that was in Christ had been operating even in the Old Testament. And so he said, I will not take anything. And he let the man go. But then Gehazi looked at all that the man had brought. Once again, he saw. Oh yes, he saw Naaman when he came. He saw the changes of raiment. 
He saw all the things that were carried by the servants of Naaman. And he said, why should Elisha let this man go like that when he saw he coveted? And what's the next thing after that? He too. He went after the man. And uh, look at verse 21. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. You see, it is that covetousness. It is that thing that is drawing from the mind, from the heart, that will make the man to even run after Naaman. Make him run after other people, wanting to take what belongs to them. When Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is it all, is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, even now, there become to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. You see, covetousness will lead to lying. Here a lie came in. Because you see, I had to give a reason. Since Elisha had rejected all those things, why will, you, why will Elisha send you now? To come and take all, all these things from me. Oh, he said, it's not because Elisha actually was changing his mind. He said, it's not because Elisha needs them, no. But two young men just came to Elisha. And Elisha has nothing to give them. And he just remembered that you are willing to drop something for him. Well, don't give to him, he said. But give to these uh, two young men. Gehazi was saying, it is not for me. It is not for Elisha. It is not for Elisha, it is not for Gezer. That's what he was saying. But these two young men that just came, he was saying, we are not taking anything from you because you are healed. It's not for me. It's not for Elisha, who was used of God to bring healing to you. You are giving these things to the two men that just came, and they have nothing to do with your healing. So, give me these things, and uh, we'll give unto them. You see, that it brought sin, more sin. Covetousness will lead to another thing. I'm, I'm sure you see that. When your eyes will see, it may be a, a girl, it may be a lady that you see. And uh, of course, uh, your mind not knowing anything, your mind will run after such a lady or such a woman. And then your mind will begin to say, I must have her, I must have her, I must have her. Because you covet that individual. I've already told you that it's possible to covet a house, inanimate object, covet an ox, an animal belonging to a neighbor, or covet a man servant, a maid servant, a wife, a woman belonging to another individual. I told you that a person can covet, and it's according to the word of God, anything belonging to your neighbor. And it's, uh, you know, sometimes you'll see people like that. You'll see ladies like that. Some people that are married, they will even lose interest in their own wives. They drive their own wives away. And uh, they will say, I want this new one. I want this new one. And that covetousness will lead to other sins in your life. And so it led to other sins in Gehazi's life. But it didn't stop there. Look at verse 23. And Naaman said, be content, take two talents. And he urged him. And he bound two talents of silver in two bags. Well, before I read on, when it says he urged him, Gehazi also was pretending. Oh, he said, no, no. I don't need more than just uh, one talent. I, do, I don't need more than just this little thing. Actually, it's because of these two young men that came. And Naaman urged him. It was, it was like he was begging him, please take it, please take it. May covetousness will even lead to pretense and hypocrisy. It will lead to lying, of course. It will lead to taking what does not belong to you and lead to other things. And he urged him, verse 23, and bound two talents of silver in two bags and with two changes of garments and laid them upon two of his servants and they bear them before him. And when he came to the tower... He took them from, the, from their hand and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go. And they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. He acted as if nothing had happened. Have you seen children? When maybe uh, mother or father is not uh, looking. 
And then they covet that food. And they want that food. Instead of saying, Mommy, I am hungry. They cannot say that because they have just eaten. But because of the covetousness that is in the nature of that child. Then he covets or she covets. And when mother or father is turning the uh, eyes away or has gone somewhere, eventually will reach out and take that thing. And may eat or may hide. And then eventually when mother or father comes back, the child will act as if nothing ever happened. That's the way Gehazi also acted. But then Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? That he said, the servant went no whither. Can you see? Although he ran to meet Naaman. Although all that discussion went on between him and Naaman. Although the covetousness had been manifested and he had taken the sin, Elisha of course knew. And he didn't need a long interview. Because of the gift of the word of knowledge in his life, he knew everything. And he said in verse 26 unto him, Went not mine heart with thee, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee, he such a time to receive money, he got money. And to receive garments, he got garments. And olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants. Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from the pres from his presence a leper as white as snow. Do you realize now what the covetousness brought on Gehazi, the servant of Elisha? Well, he became a leper. The leprosy of Naaman came upon him. That's a terrible thing. Not only that, it came upon his own descendants too. Not only that, he lost his ministry. Not only that, he lost all prestige and honor. Not only that, all that he got from Naaman, could he wear them? Could he wear those beautiful garments? Because you see, in the land of Israel, those who were lepers were despised so terribly that nobody will associate with them. And so you will see that punishment or judgment came upon him because of the thing that he had done. Covetousness is a terrible thing. And the Lord is uh, warning us, we should not allow this sin of covetousness in our lives. In Psalm 10 verse 3. Psalm 10 verse 3. For the wicked boasted of his heart's desire, and blesses the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. You see the wicked people, they have association, intimacy, friendship, agreement with those who are covetous. And yet the Bible says the covetous, the Lord abhors. The Lord keeps at a far distance. The Lord will not allow those people, the covetous, to come near unto him. They cannot have fellowship with him. And if you are a person that is uh, so friendly, so intimate with the covetous, then the favor of God will depart from you. Because it says, it is the wicked man, the wicked man that boasted of its sad desire. And it is the wicked man that blesses, that associates with the covetous. And the Lord abhors the covetous and those that have anything to do with them in intimate relationship. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, reading from verse 10. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. It's telling us of the terrible sin of covetousness. Once a person allows covetousness, and he wants uh, houses upon houses, he will never want to stop. He wants to just be amassing wealth and amassing wealth. He'll never want to stop. In fact, he'll just be amassing wealth. Not that he wants to spend the money. He just wants the money to be there. Not only really that, once a person uh, will say, I love this woman, I love this she, He cannot see any beautiful woman. Her, her, his heart will go after that woman. He'll be multiplying wives. You cannot stop at just uh, being covetous after just one woman, after just uh, three women, after just four women. Your heart will be after such a thing. 
uh, many, many times, and you'll be multiplying the women. And it may be that uh, you have a possessive attitude. It's, that's another way of saying that you are covetous. Everything you see, you want to have. Everything you see in the market, you want to buy. Everything you see around, you want to possess. A possessive attitude. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied. It's the same thing with these people that are talking about, uh, why don't they allow us to use a little jewelry? Why don't they allow us to uh, put on a little of this, a little of this? You really will not stop with that little jewelry. You go from the engagement ring to the wedding ring. You go from the wedding ring to other kinds of rings. You go from that little jewelry to another thing. You'll never be satisfied. And when you put it in the nose, in the ear, uh, you also want to put it as a belt. You want to put it as a, you know, whatever. And you want to attach it to the air and attach it to the, to the clothing. Because covetousness has no limit. It leads a man from one step of sin to another stage of sin. Verse 10. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. Nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Verse 11. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving except the beholding of them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much. But the abundance of the rich will not suffer them, will not permit them, will not allow them, allow him to sleep. So you will see that covetousness is a terrible sin. In fact, in verse 13 it says there is a so evil which I have seen under the sun, namely, riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. Everything eventually will be wasted, squandered, as he came forth of his mother's womb, naked, Shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in a son? It is telling us the foolishness of covetousness. Even if you have ten wives, when you die, none of them will go with you. Even if you have many, many houses, you build a house there, a house there, a house there. When you die, none of them you can carry away. Whatever you covet and whatever you have been amassing and just uh, possessing, uh, grabbing this and grabbing that, all for being glory, all for human foolishness. Whatever it is when you live, nothing will live with you. You, all, you only have uh, sore trouble, travail, and sorrow. In verse 16, it says, And this also is a sore evil, that in all points, as he came, so shall he go. And what profit I see that has labored for the wind? The person that is covetous is simply laboring for the wind. Laboring for the wind. You see, this uh, covetousness, it's uh, so common because it is part of the depravity of man. In Mark chapter 7 verse 21. Mark chapter 7 from verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of men. Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, covetousness, covetousness. It comes out of the heart. But then, what does conversion do uh, concerning this covetousness that is part of the natural man's life? When we become born again, when we become children of God, what will that conversion do in our lives? Well, that leads me to point number two. Conversion brings godliness with contentment. You see, when you are born again, according to the testimony of Scripture, you become a new creature. And that new creature will be totally free and totally cleansed from covetousness. In Second Chronicles chapter 5. Sorry, Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Part of the old things that pass away is covetousness. 
all things, or the old nature, or the carnal nature, or the depravity in man, all things pass away. All things become new. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. You'll find that instead of covetousness, godliness with contentment will be the thing in that individual's life. Well, we see that even from the earliest of times. When God called Abraham, Abraham became free from covetousness. You see, in the case of Lot, Lot was not free from covetousness. He didn't have a serious spiritual life. He coveted. He wanted this. He wanted this. In fact, the Bible says, when he lifted up his eyes and he saw that the place was well watered, he desired it and then he took it. And then we are told he pitched his tent toward Sodom. That is it. Covetousness brings a man near those Sodomites, near those destroyers, and near those people that have been prepared for the fires of judgment. But it is contentment that will make a person to uh, be so content and be so happy with what he has. And he doesn't have any covetousness at all. Let's see it in the life of Abraham. In Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. You see the Lord had called him. He had turned away from idol worship. He had turned away from all that he had that he was doing before which was not right in the sight of the Lord. And he had come to know the Lord. And now we see the evidence of knowing the Lord. In Genesis chapter 14 verse 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Let me remind you and give you the background of the story here. When Lord pitched his tent near Sodom, it so happened that uh, there were kings that came to Sodom, and then they waged war against them, and took Lot away, and took his wife, and took his children. Not only that, they took uh, the kings, and they took a lot of things uh, belonging to the king of Sodom. And when Abraham heard about it, because of his love, uh, he didn't say, that's good for the young man. That's good for the young man. It will teach him a lesson. No, he didn't have the spirit of revenge or retaliation he wasn't rejoicing because the unfaithful young man had fallen into trouble what he did was to take the servants raised up trained in his own household to go after those people to deliver lot and all the people of sodom so he came back after the victory and the king of sodom said oh you have tried for us you've done something for us well give us uh, the citizens and give us um, all that belongs to us concerning the persons, concerning the human beings, but as to the goods, let that be your reward. We give all that to you. Look at the reply of Abraham in verse 22. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lit up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe lashet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. I have made Abraham rich. He said, you will not say that. You will not say that. So that you will not say, I made Abraham rich. That man was free from covetousness. You see, when you are born again, we know that. Uh, there are some people, uh, ladies in particular now, that uh, they may say that uh, they have seen the will of God. And after saying that they've seen the will of God, uh, today, uh, Sunday, uh, after the service, they see the brother and they say, Oh yes, I thank God, it is the will of God. You are surprised? The second day, uh, will you not buy a scarf for me? Will you not buy a dress for me? And these shoes I'm wearing, it's uh, not befitting again. Will you not buy a shoe for me? Before the following week, the lady has been demanding for almost things that were worth 10,000, 15,000 naira. And you wonder what kind of a will of God is this. We only started last Sunday. And the following Sunday had not come. Already you are demanding days and days and that. It's already immediately after, yes, I, I agree. I praise the Lord. The Lord has revealed it to me before. And, but uh, what kind of car are we going to be using? What kind of house are we going to be living in? 
what will be the paint on the car that we are going to use i like blue i like red i like this one i like this one in fact uh, when we are uh, when we leave and uh, when we marry are we going to be in gra are we going to be in uh, uh, shomolu are we going to be in keto what is the matter uh, this thing started just about two weeks ago and the lady is already demanding for heaven and earth it is the mark of covetousness but you know abraham abraham said i've lifted up my hand to the lord that i will not take even a thread or a shoe lashed or anything that belongs unto you do you see that he, he was saying that he will not covet anything he saw them they were not even temptation to him are you like that if you are working in an office uh, as a cashier you see money coming in and money coming in and money coming in uh, do you make up your mind i will not touch the money belonging to the company there is no covetousness in you or if you are uh, working with maybe a master you are selling goods and see customers coming customers coming do you yield to the temptation if if i could pull out if i could pull away i can get some of these customers to myself you see covetousness starts in that way or it may be that uh, somebody has uh, called you to come and do something in a shop and then you begin to look around you see this machine you see this machine you see this you say, ah, when did you start uh, this thing and he said i started by the grace of god only six months ago only six months ago and you have this machine and you have this machine and you have this machine the man will not talk but in his own heart he'll begin to say uh -huh. if the man can get that in six months three months i'm going to get it if i don't get them <laughs> i don't know what i will do maybe in the night i'll just come to this man's shop after all I, I know the in and out now i'll just come god will uh, god will forgive because uh, i cannot be walking like this for so many years and not have anything there you are there you are just because to see what belongs to other people the bible says you will not covet you see when you are a child of god there will be contentment because conversion brings godliness with contentment godliness with contentment you see some pe some ladies if they see another person dress it may be ordinary scar they wouldn't listen to the rest of the message they say what where did this uh, fellow buy the headgear? Why? Where did this fellow buy the scarf? Where did this fellow buy that kind of thing? Look at the type of uh, clothes that he has sewn. Covetousness in the earth will draw their heart away from even the message that we are preaching from the word of God. Let us beware. When you are truly born again, when you are a child of God, you will find that there will be contentment, there will be godliness in your life. In fact, Jesus Christ warned against covetousness. In Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. It's dangerous. Take heed and beware of covetousness. It will ruin your Christian life and ruin you. Take heed and beware of covetousness. If it will pull you from the throne and pull you right to the ground. Take heed and beware of covetousness. It will make the uh, life of Christ, an eternal life, to, be, to leak away from your life if you are not careful. Take heed and beware of covetousness. It will make you to become an ordinary man, just like uh, the men of the world who have never tasted of the grace of God. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. So then you will see that when we are born again, the Lord wants us to have contentment. Wants us to be satisfied with what we have. In 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Reading from verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. What does this mean? Number one, godliness with contentment is great gain. It secures your place in the kingdom of God. That's a great gain. Number two, it serves you and preserves you from hypertension. Godliness with contentment. You are not so desirous and running after this and running after this to the point that your health will break down. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Not only that, it will rescue you from those uh, who will do. 
you see the people that are covetous and they, are, they do not have contentment in their lives this one will come and he will say we have discovered a business we have discovered something now and because the man is covetous himself he will say tell me uh, how much uh, capital do you need well if you just uh, bring uh, because you know this thing is going to bring millions millions it, within a few weeks we're going to become millionaires but you know all it needs is just a token amount of 50 60 thousand and you say i don't have it well you're going to lose the chance of becoming a millionaire uh, therefore if you don't bring, then you'll go and you ransack your house you you sell your car you sell this one you sell this one and you, are you sure that this thing will make us millionaire uh wait just one month you will see the outcome of this new business and then you sell what you have you put 50,000 60,000 down and then the people say we're coming now where is the house you are living how can i contact uh, don't worry in fact we're coming to the church here anytime you want to find us if you don't find us in the district church find us in the central church because we have some other connection and we connect them at the central church if you get to bagada uh, the head usher there knows my name uh, the secretary of the pastor knows my name the secretary of the church knows my name uh, the people who are working at the press you know anybody there you ask them and they will give a, a fake name if you ask them they know me and uh, you say praise the lord praise the lord you are my fellow brother and you put all the sixty thousand, you put it down and the man goes district church you cannot find him there then you come to bagada you say i'm asking for our brother which your brother i'm asking for so and so they say we, we don't know him ah, secretary knows him church secretary knows him and the press people know him everybody knows him they say we don't know anybody like that and then you say i i am gone i have sold all my property Co co you see contentment will deliver you from all that kind of thing that all the people that will do that is why when we are born again our lives become peaceful when we are born again our lives are totally changed it says godliness with contentment is great gain or not only that it will not allow you to die prematurely you see when people are not uh, contented they will join any kind of association any kind of gang and they will injure their lives but it is godliness with contentment that will make you to spend all your life without any kind of harassment and without premature death then he tells us the reason why we should be contented in verse 7 it says for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain it is certain it is certain we can carry nothing out you ask all the people that are mighty today that are rich today it is certain they are not going to carry anything out why are we destroying ourselves because of things we are not going to be able to carry out can you sleep on two beds at the same time can you wear two coats at the same time can you ride two cars at the same time what what do you have in this world that does not take moderation and put that we should put a limit because we cannot even carry anything out that day when christ comes if you make the rapture then you, what are you going to carry out with you and if you don't make the rapture eventually when death comes what are you going to uh, take away with you then it says having food and raiment in this it says let us be there with content then it says for they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful laws which draw men in destruction and perdition for the love of money that's another name for covetousness for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after have erred from the faith it causes backsliding have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows but thou o man of god flee these things and follow after righteousness godliness faith love patience and meekness you see we are being told there that we shall follow after the word of god do not allow covetousness to ruin you because we have the promise of God. He has said he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. And because we know that he will provide for us. He will meet our need. That's why we do not want our lives to be spoiled or destroyed. By covetousness. In Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Reading to you from verse 5 and verse 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Husband and wife. Let your conversation be without covetousness. 
dear sister, in courtship with a brother now, let your conversation be without covetousness. Employer with employee, let your conversation be without covetousness. Two brothers, two sisters who are friendly together, who are prayer partners together, let your discussion, your conversation be without covetousness. Let us make sure that in all that we discuss, in all that we aim at, in all that we desire, there is no covetousness in our lives. Do you know there are people that will leave a good job because of covetousness? They will say, well, although the job is good, although I'm getting something out of the job, but I think that if I go there, if I go there, if I establish on my own, if I join this together and join that together, and uh, so and so has done it. So and so has done it. In fact, uh, even, even a sister, even a sister, sister so and so, I'm surprised. And I'm sure that as a man, I can go beyond that sister. Since they have done it, I will do it. And then he gives up his job and then he cannot find anything. What he thought he will do, he cannot do. And now all that he, all that he had before, he has already resigned. He has said, I am going, I am going. Now he is jobless and penniless. Let your conversation, let your planning be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may both let say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Well, when we have been converted, when we have been born again, and by the grace of God, content, uh, being content and godliness have come into our lives, how do we maintain that constant victory before the Lord? That leads us to the third point. Maintaining victory over covetousness. Maintaining victory over covetousness. You see, the Lord can give us the victory and also can maintain the victory in our lives. In fact, that is the essence of the Christian life. It's not enough you know, to say, I've surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Am I maintaining the victory? It is not enough you know, to say, since last week, I've been free from covetousness. Do I consecrate my life to the Lord so that permanently I will remain free from covetousness, maintaining victory over covetousness? How can that be done? In Psalm 119. Psalm 119. From verse 35 to verse 38. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way establish thy word unto thy servant who is devoted to thy fear you see that's how to maintain the victory number one you come to know the lord as your personal savior not only that, number two, you give yourself to the word of God. You delight and you walk in the path of the commandments of the Lord. You love the commandments of the Lord. Number three, you fear the name of the Lord. You know that the Lord can see the slightest chain of covetousness in the earth. The Lord can tell. He knows when it passes from being a temptation to when it becomes a sin. And because of the fear you have for the Lord, because of the reverence you have for the Lord, you say, no, I will not do that lest I should displease my God. Not only that, you are inclining your heart all the time unto the testimonies of the Lord and not to covetousness. Every time you place those things side by side with the word of God, with eternal life, with the reward in heaven, and you say, heaven is greater, the crown of righteousness is greater, Stars in my crown, eventually that will be greater. Joy with the Almighty God, peace with God in heaven, that will be greater. The reward of the saints and I, that will be greater than anything I could amass, I could possess in the world. Because you are putting everything in the balance that way. You are not inclined unto covetousness. Not only that, number four, it turns away your eyes from beholding vanity. How many vain things in the world. From the look and the appearance and the dressing and the possession of people around us. There are many, many vain things in the world. But you want him to turn your eyes away from beholding vanity. If uh, just accidentally you see anything 
that is likely to bring thoughts of temptation, uh, thoughts to pursue, to desire, to lust after them in your heart. You say, Lord, wash my heart clean, cover me and cleanse me and protect me from all those things of the world so that my eyes will not be turned unto vanity. In Isaiah chapter 33. Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 15. Isaiah 33 verse 15. He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly. He that despises the gain of oppression. That shaketh his hands from holding of bribes. That stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. That shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. You see, you have to do something deliberate. You have to shut your eyes away from beholding those things. You have to shake those things away from your hand. And you have to make sure that you speak up right now. You walk righteously. You make up your mind that you are going to follow the Lord. Because you want to abide in the house of the Lord. And you will not even have any companionship, any association, any intimacy with the people that are given to covetousness. You choose your friends carefully. You choose to associate carefully. Psalm 101 verse 3. Psalm 101 verse 3. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. It shall not cleave to me. It says, I hate the work of them that turn aside from the gospel, turn aside from righteousness, turn aside from the experience we have with the Lord. I hate everything. It will not even cling unto me. In Psalm 16, verse 8. Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me. I have set the Lord always before me. I will not set the property of other people before me. I set the Lord always before me. Always looking unto Jesus. And remember that Jesus said, The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And if you have moderate accommodation, if you have food to eat and you have raiment to put on, it says, The Son of Man, our Lord and Savior, he had no place to lay his head. Why would you covet then? If your Lord did not have all those things, why are you running after them to the point you are going to break your bones and destroy your life? It says, always I'll set the Lord before me. That will be the cure for covetousness. In fact, we'll need to so consecrate ourselves. I will look at the things of the world as if they are dung and draws. So that we only, even the things we have, we only take them, we only handle them with loose hands. In Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verses 7 and 8. But what things were gained unto me, those I counted lost for Christ. That's a person who can maintain the victory over covetousness. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. What's important to you as a child of God is that you just want to live a righteous life. And whatever little sin you have, you're satisfied. You're not running after the things of the world, uh, comparing yourself with the people of the world. In Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, from verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. That's the cure for covetousness. Don't seek the things that are on the earth. Don't spend all your life running after the things in this world. Already we have found that if we have food and raiment, let us be there with content. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ seated on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above. Not on things on the earth. That's the cure for covetousness. That's how to maintain victory over covetousness. Set your affection on things above. Are you thinking of house here? Well, that's all right if it's possible to build a house without going into sin. But remember, in my father's house are many mansions. Are you thinking of, uh, you know, beautiful golden things here? Well, why don't you wait till we get to heaven? The streets are even of gold. 
are you waiting for this privilege and that privilege here well make sure it doesn't take away kingdom of god from you it doesn't take salvation from you and it doesn't take all the possession of eternal life from you but when we eventually get there we'll get more than we ever could get here on the earth set your affection on things above not on things on the earth for ye are dead and your life is seed with christ in god when christ who is our life shall appear then shall ye also appear with him in glory well you have seen today what the lord has taught us and what the lord has brought away you have seen that we can be free from covetousness before we pray just look at this verse 5 Multiply therefore your members which are upon the earth. Destroy them. Take them off your life. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Deal with it. Deal with it recklessly, brutally. Deal with it. Take it away. Tear it away from you. And say, Lord, it will not remain in my life. It will not remain in my life. You see, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, with the clear manifestation of saving faith, it will cleanse you and set you free from covetousness. Are you free from covetousness? Let's stand up now and let us talk to the Lord in prayer. If you have not been saved, obviously you will discover that this has been a major problem in your life. But you can come to the Lord. And you can repent of the fornication, the uncleanness, the mischievousness, the works of the flesh, and the covetousness as well. And give your life to the Lord. And then the Lord will save you. If you have been born again, is the devil battling with that eternal life? Is the devil battling with you, making you to see this and see this and see this? And all your discussion and being discussion on material things, how to possess, how to receive, how to build, how to have, how to amass, how to get this, how to get that. Why don't you come to the Lord today and say, Lord, I'm in a backsliding condition. Oh Lord, I'm sorry for my state. I'm sorry because my conversation has been full of covetousness. Have mercy upon me and cleanse me with the blood of Jesus Christ. Be by the grace of God, covetousness has not got a place in your heart and your life and your family. Make sure you are careful of the friends that you choose. Because you see, some friends can so influence you within one week, within one month, that your life can be totally turned around and ruined by this uh, terrible sin of covetousness beware of those uh, friends that will always be talking about material things and materialism is a great major uh, sin in their conversation without knowing the lord and always they want this they want that let everything change today call upon the name of the lord and say lord set me free and keep me free and this dynamic living saving faith will set you free from covetousness and as that faith uh, continues to grow and increase in your life, it will keep you free from covetousness. Pray unto the Lord before you go.